TFM. Welcome, boomers, to another episode of Warp 5, our dedicated Star Trek Enterprise podcast. I'm Christopher Jones, and with me, as he always is, is my esteemed co-host, Matthew Rushing. Matthew, I have to say your outfit is looking stunning today. It looks like it was molded specifically for your body size. Well, yes. I mean, you know, Starfleet is so great in uh, that they decided if you were going to have to wear an EV suit, they were going to make one that the undersuit was specifically tailored to your body. Now, I've never had a tailored suit and or tuxedo, but a tailored unitard is incredible, Chris. Well, Starfleet spares no expense to make sure that their officers are comfortable and safe when exploring deep space. I mean, and I appreciate it. Um, Not only that, but honestly, pretty stylish. Quite stylish, actually. And that was important in the episode we're going to talk about today because the crew did have to spend quite a bit of time in those EV suits as they went down to a Klingon ship. And today we're going to talk about sleeping dogs. Here's a quick summary of the episode. When the NX-01 identifies a gas giant, Archer gets excited to investigate. But a disabled ship turns out to belong to the Klingons, and the third meeting with the warrior race goes about how we would expect. Being human, the crew attempts a rescue, but becomes trapped themselves, setting off a race that requires cooperation between the burgeoning adversaries. So Matthew, just jumping right in, I put on the outline third verse, same as the first, and the second, because this is the third time that humans meet Klingons. Archer says as much, so we know that there weren't any other encounters that we haven't seen. And it's just the same thing again. They're hostile. They're threatening them. Archer and the crew are trying to help, and that doesn't get them anywhere. We've talked on here, well, we've talked about the Klingons a little bit already, especially with Broken Bow and maybe a bit in Unexpected. And we've talked about the Vulcans. And the Vulcans are portrayed very differently, and we get to see them grow as a race between the 22nd century and the 24th, which is where we primarily see them in the previous series. The Klingons, on the other hand, don't seem to be that different. So how do you feel about the portrayal of Klingons now that we're seeing them for the third time in season one? I think um, this was... It was a really interesting thing because, you know, this allows us to be able to take what we've had before and to grow it. And I think that what what it really did was it gave Archer a moment to, you know, and I think this is the key moment to to much of what's going to come later in, in Enterprise and that conversation that Archer has with Tucker where he challenges him to start thinking like a Klingon. And Mm -hmm. I think that's the thing that is going to catapult Archer's growth. But specifically just with our relationship with Klingons, you know, and and it's, it's interesting because when you're dealing with a completely different species of people, right? You know, the idea of treating people just the way you would want to be treated doesn't work because there is absolutely no connection you know that works on earth right where we we are very similar people we have similar desires drives all those kind of things but that isn't quite the golden rule for space right and so uh, when you're dealing with a species that is completely unlike us and to me that was really fascinating to see tucker realize that even before archer does like maybe you should try dealing with them on their level and what's interesting about that too is that in some ways that is a bit like human nature um and like a parent dealing with a child trying to get down Mm -hmm. to their level trying to speak to them in a way that they can understand all those type of things and so 
I I was I was really fascinated by that about this episode and I was really enjoying that instead of it like you said just being the same thing a third time this third meeting really does bring a change in the way at least Archer will deal with the Klingons from now on and I really liked that it's punctuated at the very end of the episode by him dealing with a Klingon in a Klingon style which is basically come at me bro and I'll finish you you know like yeah he would not have done that at the beginning of this adventure and so to see that change was really nice because he also knew that Klingon wasn't going to respond to anything other than a show of strength. And so right. in many ways, I feel like Teddy Roosevelt would have loved dealing with Klingons because, you know, he liked walking softly and carrying a big stick. And that's what they respond to is you carrying a really big stick and being willing to use it. Yeah, it's the classic example of dealing with the bully as well. The Klingons are bullies, really. And I think Trip maybe also realized that sometimes if you – have to deal with the bully, you have to come back at them the same way they come at you. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Because then they'll back down. Mm -hmm. They may not be scared of you, but they just realize that they're not intimidating you. And so they move on. Now, I don't know if that's exactly the reason this works for Archer here. I think the Klingon captain knew that he couldn't really fight back. He was hoping that he could threaten Archer, the way the Klingons threaten most races, and they would be scared and then they would run away. But Archer clearly had the upper hand. But regardless, Tripp's point was, yeah, as you say, sometimes you have to deal with people in the language that they understand. And it's interesting. There were two parts to this item that I wanted to discuss. One was the portrayal of the Klingons as pretty much being the same as we know them later. And another aspect that it brings to mind and what you're saying, however, is how the how humans and the Federation in the future learn to deal with the Klingon Empire. They get into this Cold War essentially with the Klingon Empire by confronting them in a way that they understand. And maybe Archer learning to do that here and then that being passed along to other captains along the way. So it becomes the way that the Federation deals with the Klingons helps prevent a hot war of the sort that may have erupted early on. You could say that, well, the Organians prevent that war because they step in and err into mercy. But there was a lot of time before that where the humans and the Klingons could have gotten into a much broader, bloodier conflict. Yeah, I think um, you saying that, uh, and as you were talking, I was just thinking about the, you know, the the way we see people move forward, you know, even Archer, and then I think about the way that Kirk deals with uh, the the Klingons with all the run-ins that they have and the way in which you know, he he definitely, I think, deals with them on their level, which is more confrontational, which I really liked. And and I thought it was great to see Archer – basically, I, I, I love the idea that he was doing research. He, you need to know the people that you're running into and, and how – how do they think? How to interact with them? What is mm-hmm. their thought process? You know, what is their worldview? And so that he can speak to them in a way that they will understand and will be beneficial for both. So I, I thought that, that was really nice because, you know, it's a, it's a great reminder of just kind of the way in which if we want to interact with anyone, we do need to do our research. We need to know them. We need to know how they think. We need, you know, and, and so, and especially in, in a more confrontational uh, style, if you're looking to avoid bloodshed, this is exactly what you want, right? And so I thought that that was great. And learning that they have this desire to hold to honor, he's able to use that because he understands the idea of honor and, and beginning to understand then the way that they think about that, he's able to use that to his I, I mean, I don't even know want to say advantage because, but it's 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 mm-hmm. a way to bring understanding so that the Klingons would see what he's talking about as 
beneficial and helpful and so yeah all of that i thought was really interesting in this episode and it you know it's fascinating that all this stuff is happening in like a 42 minute episode but Mm -hmm. actually a lot kind of happens here when you think about the trajectory now of the klingon relationship with humanity and especially the way in which humanity in the form of the crew of the enterprise is going to be dealing with these people from now on Another thing I did want to point out I thought was great here was that these Klingons are very much like the Klingons in the original series. You know, they're raiding places. They don't care, you know. Um, I mean, I thought all that stuff was great because it felt very much like those Klingons who, before the Organians, there's no leash on them whatsoever. They're just out there doing what they want. Yeah, yeah. The leash is on the Targ, not on the Klingons. Literally. Yes, exactly. (laughs) But yeah, when you brought up needing to understand the other side, I was starting to think about that just as you started talking about it, putting it in a real world context. It's not just doing research, like Archer is doing research to learn about the Klingons. But what's important is that he realizes that he needs to do it and he's willing to do it. And he wants to understand the other side so that he can find some way to cooperate with them to get a positive result. And again, that's something that I feel is increasingly lost in the world today. Like We don't want to understand the other side. We just want to tell them that they're wrong. And then we want to try to beat them into submission. And... Obviously, that wouldn't work here for Archer. Archer knows that he's not going to be able to tell the Klingons that they're wrong, that their behavior is bad, that they should change. He's going to have to find a way to talk to them on their level to hopefully get some sort of change, some sort of cooperation. Mm -hmm. But if not, to at least find a resolution that results in everyone leaving alive. And... That that's maybe, yeah, the central point of this episode for me in terms of what I take from it in the context of broader Star Trek and also in a social message. Yeah, I mean, I thought that whole idea of trying to speak in a way that somebody can understand and can hear mm-hmm. uh, is very, very interesting. And yeah. and I think, uh, you know, a key component to being successful here on Earth, right? Like, we have to learn how to be able to communicate with one another. And, um, you know, it's not just about the universal translator, but it's about understanding the meanings behind the words. And this yeah. is what makes communication so important. And, and for words to have specific meanings when we just start throwing words around like they mean nothing, then our communication towards one another is meaningless. And so mm-hmm. I think that was that's really interesting because obviously Hoshi can translate something, but but to actually like Archer is now learning to understand the meaning behind the words for the Klingons as they're saying them. Yeah. That changes everything. And so right. I you know, it makes for, you know, I think a really good episode in that way. It, it's, it's like you said, this is the third time we've run into the Klingons. And so this is, we're taking another step towards having a, a better understanding, if not hopefully a better relationship with them. Who knows, mm-hmm. you know, what the next one will look like. But at least Archer is on a better footing to deal with Klingons in the future. Yeah. Last thought before we move on. You mentioned today people throw words around like they mean nothing, but also people throw words around which to them really mean something, but they don't mean anything to the people who they're throwing them at mm-hmm. a lot of the time because they're sometimes they're, they're words that are being applied to situations that are fairly new words. And Instead of taking the time to help people understand what they mean so that you can create understanding and communication, the words are just thrown out there as if everyone is supposed to know exactly what it means. 
And I think that creates a lot of misunderstanding as well. And I, I loved, I didn't put language as a point on the outline because I didn't think there was enough to talk about in terms of language, but can still in season one, they're continuing to work with language because of Hoshi developing the Universal Translator. They're working with language in a way that I really love as someone who actually has a degree in language and studied linguistics and and language for so many years in that when Hoshi is translating the Klingon, you know, they're coming up with words. They're not one-to-one translations from Klingon to English, but they represent the same ideas and then they have to figure out, oh, well, this means hull, for example. That kind of thing, I just really love how Enterprise does that. And as we've talked about before, I'm glad in later Star Trek that we just take it for granted that the Universal Translator works so that overall the story can just move along. Right. But within a prequel situation like this one, I love the fact that they're actually taking the time to continue to make this a point of the story Mm -hmm. just here and there that we're learning as we go. Yeah. No, I could agree with you more. And I find it really interesting every time that it happens on the show. And what I loved here is that obviously that we were building on the other two times that we'd met the Klingons. And so the universal translator is much better, but it's still not Mm -hmm. perfect. And, and like Hoshi said, you know, there's a big difference between speaking and reading our language. And so even her not being completely proficient yet in reading Klingon, even though she's much better Mm -hmm. at understanding and now speaking it. I loved that too, because that's also very realistic. Right. As someone who reads a language that you can't actually read by just looking at it, you have to really study and learn that being Japanese, using Chinese characters, you have no clue what they mean in terms of the sounds from just looking at it. I appreciate what's implied here with Hoshi in that as a linguist, she's intrigued by the Klingon language. And she's obviously, even though they've only met the Klingons two times before, and they don't know if they're going to be meeting them frequently or not, she's clearly been studying Klingon. She She's mm-hmm. probably fascinated by the writing system, I guess, because she does read the Klingon off the screens when they go to the ship. And that's something that you wouldn't be able to do unless you've really been... Uh, putting time into learning that. And so I like that implication that she's studying this language since that first encounter. Because that language, remember, that's how Archer hooked her into coming aboard the ship in the first place in Broken Bow. Okay, well, while we're talking about Hoshi, this episode is really good for Hoshi's growth because we know from Fight or Flight that she was really having trouble coming to grips with being in space. And she really had this fear of the unknown that she was fighting. And bit by bit, she's been overcoming it. But here, she actually goes to Archer and requests to be put on the away team to go on a mission that is clearly going to be dangerous. And it seems that, you know, she's finally taken that that big step And I think it's taken her probably a reasonable amount of time for someone in that situation. How do you feel about that? I think you're right. Uh, And, you know, I love that we get this moment of her confessing to Archer. I want to try this, you know, like I'm I'm working on getting better at this, you know, and this is the next step to doing that. And I think that's great. Uh, Again, it's. I feel like it is the writers paying attention to the characters and being like, okay, we've had enough time. Wouldn't it be great if we allowed this character to proactively look to grow and then put them in a situation that tests that to the limit? I think that that's really nice that they had the forethought for that. And that they allowed the character to do that because it does make Hoshi a more interesting character. And I think it does take care of some of the criticisms that people kind of had of her by allowing us to see her growth is not just something, oh, well, you know, we won't actually even show the process, 
but we're going to actually show the process of these characters growing. And to me, that's great. Yeah. And not only do they show the process in taking to episode 14 for her to overcome this, but even on this mission, she has an anxiety attack. And mm-hmm. T'Pol helps calm her. And so I also liked that it wasn't like a switch they flipped where it's like, okay, oh, she's okay now. She can go on away missions. And then she's just the brave Starfleet officer from that point forward. During the course of the mission, her fears do come back, which I think would happen for most people. And so that felt real. And the fact that T'Pol helps calm her is also character growth for T'Pol. And at the end of the episode, when they're in the decon chamber, and T'Pol says, well, yeah, maybe we should have a little bit more time in here. It's not because T'Pol wanted to stay in there, but it's because T'Pol understood that her human crewmates needed a little bit more time. And again, that's character growth for T'Pol. From the beginning of the series to now, bit by bit, becoming more comfortable and understanding her human crewmates. Yeah, I thought that that was a great part of the episode because it's not just Hoshi that's growing in this episode. It's not just Archer that's experiencing some growth. It's the entire crew that we get a chance to spend time with in this episode. Everybody is learning to grow together as a crew. And this was a big character moment for to Paul to see a character to which she's kind of had not necessarily the best, you know, thoughts about probably internally Mm -hmm. and to stop to see that this character had put themselves in a place to grow and obviously still has a way to go and realize, hey, I can actually help this person. I can help this person overcome this obstacle. And I thought that that was great. And, and you know, for a Vulcan to be willing to touch someone and to teach them something Vulcan that's not a Vulcan was a big deal as well because we know how much Vulcans put on the idea of touch. It's not something you really do, right? You know, unless you are close to a Vulcan, you don't initiate touch. We see that throughout the history of the Vulcans. So I I thought that, that was such a powerful moment that she stops, she addresses Hoshi, and she's there to help her learn something that is going to allow her to overcome this flood of emotion that she's yeah. having such a hard time dealing with. And it's a it's a real vulnerable moment for both of them because Hoshi's admitted something that is quite personal, which is, I wish that I could turn off my feelings the way you do. And T'Pol takes that very seriously. And I just I really appreciated that moment. It was, it was a very nice moment between those two characters. And it's very vulnerable for both of them, which is a, a place that I think you want your characters in a prequel series. Mm-hmm. And just months earlier, in terms of the story, T'Pol and Hoshi were kind of at each other. You yes. remember coming on the bridge and Broken Bow and Hoshi strikes back at T'Pol and Vulcan and T'Pol says, I was told to speak English on this mission. And they were really butting heads at first. And, and then to go from that to the point of this very intimate touch, as you describe to help her. And and it wasn't like to pull this was... magic moment. <laughs> <laughs> See, if if this series had been like for all mankind, something like that, they probably would have played music like that. That yeah, song there you actually go. Yeah. at that moment in the episode. <laughs> <laughs> so but it wasn't a case of T'Pol thinking, okay, I need to help my crewmates so that we can all get out here alive either. It really felt like a genuine concern for Hoshi. So it's an important character growth there as well. The The crew overall, yeah, comes together and we're feeling more and more like 
they're becoming comfortable in their own skins as space explorers. Situations like this that they have never encountered before, but are, as we know, routine for Starfleet officers, but they're, they're learning to deal with it. And, and one of the best parts, too, to kind of bring it all around with the idea of growth is Hoshi and Malcolm convincing to Paul that the best way forward is with the weapons. And yeah. Hoshi's a big part of agreeing with Malcolm in this and convincing to Paul to trust these officers that they are doing their best to keep them alive. And I love Hoshi being like, look, I didn't come here to die in a gas giant. And so if we're going to die, we're going to go out trying. Right. Yeah. So it, it was just... it. Like the whole episode supports you getting to this point, and it's just a really nice thing to to kind of see all of these different characters working together and 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 learning from each other, and and not ever being offended when you know you get one person who's showing a weakness. No, they're allowing each other to see their weaknesses so they can gain strength from the sharing. Maybe they belong right. in Star Trek Five. <laughs> Right, maybe so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's talk about one more item here that just caught my eye. There's this missing moment in this episode. The version that aired is missing a little bit of a scene that is extended on the DVD and the Blu-ray release, or it, it, at least it's there as an extra scene. I, I don't think it's actually spliced into the the running at time. But the scene is the one where Tripp and Archer are discussing the decision to ask Buka for help. And Tripp tells Archer that it's time to start thinking like a Klingon. So the scene that you know we were talking that about. That is on Paramount Plus. Well, that that scene is there in the mm-hmm. original. But the scene okay. ends with Tripp telling Archer it's time to start thinking like a Klingon. And then it cuts to the next scene. But the original version of the scene and you can see the extended part in the extras on the discs, is Phlox contacting Archer and telling Archer that he has found a cure for Bukas' condition, but that there is an interesting wrinkle that they should discuss. And the reason that this caught my eye, I can see them removing it to get the running time where it needs to be, because I don't think it's important for the story at all. But what's interesting is that it comes in the next episode after Dear Doctor, where Archer and Phlox have this back and forth about a cure and Phlox's reluctance to share the information and the the sort of tension that that created between Archer and Phlox. And then we get the ultimate resolution to that in Dear Doctor, which you and I discussed last week on the show. What do you think? about that in terms of the evolution of that relationship between Archer and Flux. I love that that's a moment that they had written in the episode because I do feel like that is a wonderful bit of connective tissue between what had happened previously and what's happening here. And obviously, this is a moment where you see there's no hesitation for Flux to talk about something with the captain like this. Like, Archer has earned his trust and and I think it's a great moment because you know regardless of what happened in the previous episode Flox should be bringing these type of things to the captain that's his job as the chief medical officer it is not his job to keep anything from the captain especially that's so important to the mission and so yeah I, I think that's one of those things where those type of little moments, you could tell that the writers were actually really paying attention. And that's the type of thing I think that both you and I on the orb have praised Deep Space Nine so many times for right. is, is yeah. these little yeah. tiny things where something's mentioned and it references something that's happened in the past. And that's the that's the way in which you don't have to have ultra serialization like we do in Trek today. I guess minus lower decks, but the other Trek shows, the, right, the live action right. ones are, are, are that. 
this, I think, is the perfect way to be able to do that. And so, uh, gr- uh, to me, it just shows how much the writers are, you know, I mean, th- they're thinking mm-hmm. about this stuff. Yeah. And I wish it had been left in the episode for that reason. Like I said, I don't have any problem with them cutting it because it doesn't mm-hmm. affect the story in any way. But right. when you look at the series as a whole and you look at relationship development and character development, it would have been nice to have that little bit yes. there. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I agree. I but, mean, I, I agree. You know, and, and I don't, I don't know if it was cut specifically for running time, but you know, this is something that, especially newer fans who weren't watching Star Trek in first run, don't realize is that mm-hmm. because of commercials on broadcast television back then, you really had to nail the running time. That's why, if you look, Star Trek episodes are usually within about five seconds of each other from week to week and sometimes they're identical length so some little thing like this really can make a difference and sometimes had to be dropped Mm -hmm. a quick mention here as we get ready to wrap up probably not a big discussion but we do talk about trek firsts that we get in enterprise and we got four of them either mentioned or seen in this episode Photon torpedoes. Malcolm was really excited about that. Never heard of those before. So, you know, perhaps Malcolm left there thinking, we need to figure out how to build these photon yeah. torpedoes, you know. <laughs> and the there's a mention of bird of prey as a Klingon ship. It's the first time that we hear that mentioned. And then we get to see Gok, which from the start does not look very appetizing to me and then we also get to see a targ first mention and first visualization of a targ and this is also the first all cgi targ to be used in star trek yeah i think i really liked all of these things because they create some fun anticipation like we don't see the bird of prey which is great Mm -hmm. you know we uh, only see this raptor uh ship which i I think is great the fact that we see a new klingon vessel the fact that even to paul that she's like that there's you know many klingon vessels that i've never seen before and and the fact that we're on a klingon ship the fact that we would see uh you know and 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 an earlier klingon vessel than we've ever been on before so you know the the way they have their food hanging up and all this kind of stuff. Uh, the, the idea that, you know, Targs apparently aren't just pets. They could also be m- meals. So uh, that's interesting. <laughs> right. um, yeah. I don't know if I want a good plate of, I you know, I maybe Targ is better than Gach, but who knows? Um, they both sound disturbing and disgusting. So, but I, I like all of this, you know, mainly just because we're on this vessel. And one of the things I thought was kind of cool is that it does show how we're reminding the audience that humans are new to space. So Klingon vessels are in some ways better made, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, the stresses they can take in space and their weapons are better. Obviously, it makes sense mm-hmm. that their weapons would be better because Klingons are obsessed with conquering people. So, you know, right. and in battle. And so for them to have this, I think, is really fantastic. And so I like all of these things because many of them are just little teases for what will come next. Yeah. Yeah. It's fun to just drop them in. And uh, I Again, I love the fact that we get the first mention of Bird of Prey, a ship that we know very well, while aboard a Klingon ship that we're seeing for the first and only time. Like, we've never seen this Raptor ship before, mm-hmm. and we never see it again. And then we get the reference to one of the most common Klingon ships. As for Targ, <laughs> as you were saying that, now I'm picturing the next generation when the targ appears on the bridge of the enterprise i'm wondering if Worf started salivating when he saw that targ secretly mm, i don't anyway. know he's looking for some targ chops i think so a little roast beast yeah a, a leg of targ cling on holiday meal mm. yeah <laughs> all right well let's wrap up with final thoughts and our rating on this one I thought, you know, rewatching this episode, the things that stuck out to me, we talked at length about, and I 
enjoyed rewatching this episode and and had a good time with it. I I thought it's the kind of episode that made sense where, you know, they, they just come across a situation in which it doesn't go the way they thought it would because they're dealing with an alien species. And here it's the Klingons and getting a chance to learn more about them and uh, I had, uh, yeah, a great time rewatching this episode, and and for me personally, I I think this is it's a really solid episode. Is it one of the better episodes of the season? Probably not, but I do think that this is a good episode, and I would give it, you know, three and a half out of five targs. Well, for me, I enjoy the episode for the reasons that we talked about today. I think it's a good episode for the character building and the establishment of the relationship between humans and Klingons. I think I'm pretty well known for people who have been listening to me for the past decade plus on these podcasts as not being a big fan of Klingon episodes. I I don't know. To me, the Klingons are one of the less interesting races in Star Trek, species in Star Trek, because they're uh, a bit more static than some of the other species in terms of their development. But I think that they did a good job with this episode of capturing the Klingon aesthetic. The makeup was good, and the interior of the ship, the atmosphere of the ship, I think they did a nice job of taking what we already know, especially from earlier on the timeline. You know, if I think back to some of what we saw in the films, for example, and and bringing that to life with the the newer approaches and lighting and techniques and all that they had at their disposal when they were making the episode. So I thought they did a nice job with it. And overall, I think it's a middle of the road Star Trek episode for me, but it does cover a lot of good points. So I'm going to give it five siren calls. Excellent. I guess that's out of 10 then. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> Actually, yes. Most of my ratings, although they seem completely random, they're usually out of 10. So yeah, five out of 10. All right. Well, Matthew, when you're not, you know, exploring the bowels of Klingon ships looking for culinary delicacies that you've never tried before, where can people find you? Well, I guess when I'm not throwing up, uh, you could find me all over social media <laughs> under the name Mount Rushing Zero Two. So you know, Twitter, Instagram, Letterbox, Vero, all of those places. Uh, you can find me. Um, of course, here on the network, doing quite a few things. Um, the big thing that I do is the 602 Club, which is our whole other side of the network, talking about all the fandoms that we love outside of Star Trek, because there is so much what we love. There are a couple bonus shows in that same feed uh, with Snyder Cuts as well as Assembling Avengers where John Mills and I talk through some very specific things, whether it's Zack Snyder's films or the Marvel films. You can also find me here on the network doing Literary Treks and The Orb. Literary Treks is about the books and the comics of Star Trek. Uh, and The Orb, Chris, you and I talk about Star Trek Deep Space Nine together, so we promise we're going to get some more episodes out soon. Uh, and then you could find me over on the Nerd Party Network talking about a few things. One is Harry Potter over on Owl Post. Did that with Drea Kaufman. It is a finished and completed show. We talked through every single chapter of that series, one chapter at a time. And then I'm on aggressive negotiations with John Mills as we talk about Star Wars each and every week. Uh, Chris, um, when you're not trying to get fitted for your own EV suit, undersuit, where can we find you? Well, yeah, that is my plan for today. I don't know. Maybe you've hacked into my Fantastical or something, but I will be doing that right after we finish recording. But beyond that, if you want to hear my thoughts on Star Trek, you can catch me on other shows here on the network. Of course, you mentioned The Orb and Literary Treks. Also, I have The Ready Room, which I do with Larry Nemechek Interface. And you can also find me in many episodes in the back catalog on a lot of shows, including this show. I was the original host of Warp 5 and was around for the first, I don't remember now, couple of years of the show, I think, year, year or so anyway. So you can hear me talk more enterprise on here. And if you would like to chat with me in social media, you can find me on Twitter. That's where I'm most active. My username is C Brian Jones, letter C and Brian with a Y. 
And that's my name pretty much everywhere in social media. And I'd love to chat with you about Star Trek or whatever you want to talk about. Now, Matthew and I would love to hear your thoughts on this episode that we talked about today. If you'd like to share those, of course, you can talk to us, as we've mentioned here in social media. The network's username in social media is Trek FM. And you can also join the Babel Conference, which is our listeners group on Facebook. If you're not yet a member, just type Babel, B-A-B-E-L, into the search field on Facebook, and it should come right on up. It is a closed group, so you will need to answer the questions and agree to the rules of the forum so that I can let you in. But we post a discussion thread for each episode, and you can chat with us and other listeners there in the group. And if you'd like to send us email, you can also do that by going to our website, trek.fm slash contact. Use the form there. Choose to send to a show and choose Warp 5, and that will come to Matthew and me by email. And if you'd like to help us keep all of this going, we could definitely use your help through Patreon. It takes a lot of money to operate the network, and the last couple of years have been quite rough for us. If you'd like to support us and help us keep everything going and make the network healthier for the future, visit patreon.com slash trekfm. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm to find out how you can help and get involved in the network. And we want to send a big thank you to everyone who's supporting us right now. We really could not do this without your help. Well, Matthew, I hope you're ready to rewind a little bit next week because we're going to be following up a story from earlier in the season as we step into the shadows of Pajim. Chris, I couldn't be more excited. Let's go. 